In this video we're going to be looking at some telecommunications fundamentals. Fundamental to telecommunications is the notion of time and frequency. This instrument on the left here is an oscilloscope and the horizontal axis on the display is time. So it displays a waveform in what we call the time domain. The instrument on the right is displaying the same signal but in this case the horizontal axis is in terms of frequency. This is what we call a spectrum analyzer and it's displaying a signal in what we call the frequency domain. Now time and frequency of course are related by this equation here which is frequency equals 1 over time. Sometimes it's useful to look at a signal in the time domain and other times it's more useful to look at it in the frequency domain. And we'll see some examples of that shortly. Sine waves are used extensively in telecommunications and one of the reasons uh, is that they're very easy to generate but another reason is that they have very favorable properties. So here we can see a sine wave which has an amplitude of 2, that's the symbol A in this equation here, and can you tell what the frequency of this sine wave is? If the horizontal axis is in units of seconds, what's the frequency? Well, if we look at the period, one period of this sine wave is 2 seconds. So the frequency is 1 over that, which is 0.5 hertz. And the phase shown in this equation here is theta. In this case is zero because we can see it starts at zero. It's a sine function with no shift in time. So the phase in this case is zero. So there's three things that determine a sinusoid which is the amplitude, the frequency, and the phase. Now there was a very famous French mathematician known as Fourier and he proved that any signal regardless of what it was could be represented as a weighted sum of sine waves and each of the sine waves could have different amplitudes, different frequencies and different phases and any complex signal made up of different sine waves can be viewed in either the time domain or the frequency domain. Now one application that we're going to look at to illustrate this concept is what we know as DTMF, dual tone multi-frequency. And it's the uh, this international standard that we use for the tone which is generated when we press a key on a keypad like when we're dialing a number on a telephone. When we press one of the keys on the keypad, let's say in this case C, the signal that's generated is the sum of a row sine wave and a column sine wave and the rows, the frequency is given here. So in this case for the C key it is 852 hertz and the column frequency is 1633. So when we add those two sine waves together we get this complex waveform here. Now it's, I say it's complex but it's really only made up of two frequency components. So we can go to this website here and we can actually um, see what that sound or hear what that sounds like.
uh, for different uh, symbols. But let's play this example here. So we're all familiar with the sort of sounds that come out of uh, the keypad when we press the numbers. So now you know what those uh, tones are. It's when we press any key, it's the sum of two sinusoids with the row and the column frequency. Now, <clears throat> here we can see um, a signal in both the time domain and the frequency domain. And the question that I want to ask you is how many buttons were pressed? Now, if we look at it in the time domain, we can clearly see that we've got these three chunks of waveform. And so it's pretty clear from uh, this particular diagram that we've got one key here, one here, and one here. But looking at the frequency domain, we can see we've got uh, one spike here at around about uh, 770 hertz. So that would correspond to this uh, row. Uh, and then we've got another one here at about 850 and another one here at uh, 940. And then we've got this spike up here at uh, 1336. But we don't actually know how many keys were pressed from the frequency domain plot. But clearly we can see from the time domain plot that we do have a number of um, keys pressed here. So for this particular analysis, uh, the time domain is a more useful representation. But uh, if we look at the next one, which is what key was actually pressed, then it's very clear from this one that the frequency domain is much more useful. Here we can clearly see the two frequencies uh, that were um, pressed, and we can't really tell that very easily from the time domain trace. So in this case, the frequency domain is much more useful. This particular representation is a combination of both time and frequency. So we've got time along the horizontal axis and we've got frequency along the vertical axis. And from this particular plot, um, we, we can see amplitude here in color. Um, in this case, we can clearly see which keys were pressed uh, in a given uh, sequence. So in telecommunications, we sometimes use time information and other times we use frequency information and sometimes we use both. Now, why is this important? Because uh, in telecommunications, uh, we often look at a particular medium over which we send signals from one place to another and we have many many different signals going through that medium we can have many different signals going through that medium at one time this chart at the top here shows the radio frequency spectrum in Australia in various different bands and all these different colors indicate the different uses. Uh, so the frequency is divided up into these bands or sections and uh, only certain people with certain equipment can use those bands uh, otherwise you get into big trouble from the government. So this is all controlled by the by the government and anybody that wants to use particular bands may have to pay the government um, large sums of money. So people like uh, Telstra, Optus, Vodafone, etc. They use their mobile phone spectrum and that spectrum is auctioned to the highest bidder. Uh, 
So here you can see a um, particular band of frequencies and you can see different um, bands allocated here in different colors and, um, and when we use that particular band we have to make sure that we only transmit um, power within that allocated band. Modulation and demodulation is the process of shifting a baseband signal to a high frequency uh, which we, we call the carrier frequency. So here on the left hand side we've got the um, the message signal that we want to send, in this case it's just a sine wave. And here we've got the carrier signal which is a much higher frequency. And when we multiply those two together, that's, that's how we modulate them, we end up with this waveform here which is known as a double side band suppressed carrier modulated signal. And if we look at that in the frequency domain, here we can see a plus and minus frequency uh, value for the uh, related to the uh, message frequency. And then we have the same thing for the carrier at a much higher frequency. And when we multiply the two, the equivalent operation in the frequency domain is to shift this spectrum so that it's now centered on this carrier signal. So we just take that whole thing and we shift it up and down and we end up with the spectrum of the modulated signal. Demodulation is the opposite process where we shift that modulated signal back down to baseband. Now if we go back one slide we'll see why this is really important because if we want to get a particular signal up into this orange band here we've got to modulate it up at this carrier frequency. You know, whereas if we wanted to modulate it up to this frequency we would have to use a different carrier frequency. So telecommunications using all these different bands involves modulating up to a much higher frequency and then at the receiver um, shifting it back down uh, at the band that we want to um, use it at. So part of the reason that we modulate is so that we can use all these different bands at the same time um, but another reason that we modulate is so that transmission is actually practical. Now if you think about TV transmission using radio frequency spectrum electromagnetic waves propagating in the air um, we have to actually uh, transmit that using a transmitter and we have an antenna on our roof of our house to receive that information. Now it turns out that an antenna has to be a roughly equal to the wavelength of the signal in order to be efficient. So it turns out that the wavelength of the frequencies that we use for TV transmission is around about a meter or so of the order of a meter. So that makes um, putting something on our roof about that size quite practical. If it was a much lower frequency um, we might need something which is in the order of a kilometer, an antenna which was physically the size of a kilometer. Now clearly that's not going to be practical to have an antenna which is a kilometer long on top of everyone's roof. So the frequency at which we operate um, determines the physical size of the antenna that we're going to use. Now similarly for mobile phones we wouldn't want to have a meter long antenna because that wouldn't fit in our pocket. So we have a much higher um, frequency which means a lower wavelength, shorter wavelength and the antenna can then be of the order of about 10 centimeters which is what is inside our mobile phones. So that's um, another reason that we modulate signals is to make the, uh, the transmission uh, more practical. But a final reason that we modulate is also um, because of overcoming um, transmission impairments and one such impairment is what we call multipath propagation. So if we're down here talking on our mobile phone, the signal that we receive uh, 
is actually not just the signal directory from the transmitter that propagates in a straight line to our mobile phone, but it's actually the sum of many different signals that get um, reflected and refracted. So we have another signal that bounces off this building and another signal that bounces off another building and they all get summed together. And so these multi-path um, signals interfere with this, this main signal and so we, uh, uh, we have difficulty, we may have difficulty receiving and interpreting that signal. But modulation can um, help us to overcome these things if we're clever about the way we do the modulation. There's ver various types of modulation. Um, two main types, analog and digital. And in analog modulation, the message signal, the thing that we want to send, is in an analog form. So over here we can see a graph of a speech signal and we can see it's in an analog form. It's uh, continuous in time and so it would be represented as um, a voltage signal um, or maybe it's recorded on a magnetic tape or something like that so it's in an analog form whereas uh, a digital signal the message signal is in digital form so what we've done is we've taken that speech signal and we've turned it into a series of zeros and ones and we'll talk about how we do that later on in another video but in this case what we're doing is the we're using the zeros and ones to um, we're modulating that over a channel and then at the other end all we need to do is decide whether a zero or a one was sent and then uh, we can uh, reconstruct the signal at the far end so analog modulation um, has two two different subtypes continuous wave and pulse analog and we'll look at those in the next video Analog modulation is simple to use, but the quality is difficult to control, especially over very long distances. So the more that we try and amplify the signal as it, um, as it fades over, over distance, um, we make it a little bit worse each time we, we amplify it. So the quality of the signal degrades. Whereas with digital modulation, it's more complex. Um, but we have greater control over the quality and it can be designed to be almost perfect. And we'll talk more about that in a later video.